So thank you, uh, Hitesh, uh, very much for this invitation and to all the other organizers as well. Uh, and uh, I've enjoyed all the talks this morning. I am going to continue in the same vein on talking about topological matter. Uh, the reason for the inserting the mini is, you know, if you think of revolutions, they are, you know, what might come to your mind are like the Copernican revolution with our Earth, which is no longer at the center, but a mere speck of dust uh, going around the sun. That would be like a big revolution or the Darwinian revolution. And within our own field, um, topology has been a very important theme. And within that, this is sort of my a uh, question that got me interested uh, when I first learned about topological uh, matter from, in fact, Aunt B Bernowick's book, which, is, uh, which was a very, came at a very good time. So essentially, um, the, the point, main point is that you have, uh, in a topological band insulator, there is a band gap in the bulk and this bulk boundary correspondence, which gives rise to edge or surface state, and the topological properties, as we heard in, this, in the morning, are protected by the presence of that gap. So what I'm going to talk about today are semi-metals, where the gap pinches off at a point, and the question is, how does such a system still retain its topological properties? But before I get into that, I wanted to take a step back uh, and just set quantum matter, which is what we all study, and uh, put it on, give you the big picture of how we might think about it. So for a long time, we were only thinking on the left side here, uh, by according to the Landau paradigm, where you can characterize quantum matter by a local order parameter. And that's precisely what happens in typical magnets or superconductors. And this leads to a whole host of things. There is spontaneously broken symmetry, and that leads to um, Goldstone modes and stiffness associated with the uh, local order parameter that develops. So this is all a very familiar pathway. But the a big revolution in our field was this topological paradigm. And I'm classifying this into two further categories, what I've denoted by IQHE, that's the integer quantum Hall effect, quote unquote. Uh, essentially, what I mean by that are uh, situations where interactions are not dominating. And uh, you know they may be present, but they don't really dictate the topological nature. So topological band theory would be part of this, uh, this side. Uh, so all of this discussion on topological insulators, uh, semi-metals, and even systems that have short-range entanglement, like Haldane's chain and so on, would be on this side. And the, more, on the strongly interacting side that I've denoted by FQHE, these have topological order. So the word topology is, word in, is used in many places, but th these are completely different situations. Here, um, not, uh, not only you don't have a local order parameter, but you can't describe it in terms of any bands because interactions are important. So for ex example, quantum spin liquids would be part of this category. In such cases, you have long range entanglement. Um, the ground state shows dege multiple degeneracy depending on the, on the geometry that you're looking at, and the excitations are fractionalized. So this is a very exciting field, and my own group is doing a lot of work on quantum spin liquids, um, the Kitai of spin liquids, and so on. But today I'm going to talk about this side here through the wild semi-metals. Okay, so, um, you know, this being a workshop rather than a seminar, I thought, you know, if you're getting into this field, there are always some anchor points, sort of, you know, that you have to know really well because that then helps you launch into the more difficult uh, aspects. So, um, you know, and I realize you've had lots of talks by now, so I'm not really going to go through these in detail, 
but it's useful to really understand the behavior of an electron in a magnetic field whose direction is changing. Adiabatic theorem and gaps, I'll go over this really quickly now. And then this is a, a very nice review article uh, that talks about wild semi-metals and Dirac semi-metals. And um, really, uh, this my some of the research in my group is, has focused on what are some of the magnetothermal properties of these materials that might be different because of the topological nature. So I'll tell you about some predictions we had, um, which were which which uh, which were basically a theoretical paper. And very soon, uh, within months of our making this prediction, our th experimental colleagues at Ohio State have been able to um, see this effect of this unusual uh, mm, conveyor belt type transport of entropy. So similar to what some of you may know uh, from Potter and Vishwanath, they did the uh, electric, they did the electric analog, but here we have looked at the thermal effect. So that's broadly my, uh, my talk, my first talk today. And tomorrow I'll talk about superconductivity and another small revolution, mini revolution, talking about how an insulator can become a superconductor. Because again, there, the standard picture is that a metal can become unstable and become a superconductor. But the mini revolution comes from unusual effects when an insulator becomes a superconductor. Okay. Now, before delving into my talk, uh, I realized that uh, you know I am here at the Magnet Lab, and Dirac spent the last few years of his life at the Magnet Lab, and this talk is about actually Dirac semi-metals, uh, that's and wild semi-metals, which are a subset of the Dirac semi-metals. So this is just um, paying homage to uh, this uh, very influential physicist who basically combined quantum mechanics and special relativity and introduce the concept of the monopole, all of which are central to this topic. Okay, so you have, I noticed that uh, Stratos gave a couple of talks and you have heard quite a lot about wild semi-metals. This is a caricature picture here. And going into it, um, I think it's always useful to ask questions that you know bubble up in your own mind. So for me, the first question was, when you have degenerate states, why are they not hybridizing and opening up a gap? That's the first question that might come to your mind. You know, typically, if you have two states that, uh, that uh, become degenerate, they can mix and uh, then open up a gap. So why does that not happen? And is it the same as a Dirac semi-metal or different? What do these plus and minuses refer to? How do these topological features that um, Stratos may have talked about, the monopoles and uh, Fermi arcs, how do they arise? Can we see these explicitly in some calculations? So I don't want to just, I want to give you some of the details behind these properties. Okay. So, um, Let's uh, look at the adiabatic theorem, which is central to defining the topological uh, properties of any system. So here we are going to look at a closed manifold. In this case, it's just the Brillouin zone with periodic boundary conditions. And let's say I have some Hamiltonian, which has a bunch of bands uh, dispersing in some manner as a function of k. So the main point of being able to define its topological property is to think of k as some parameter that, that, let's say, changes in time. As a result, the wave function evolves and picks up phases. So here is the usual dynamical phase. But in addition, the phase of interest to us is this geometric phase. And the geometric phase is just given by the overlap of the wave function always sitting on one particular band, but observing its overlap at two nearby k points. This overlap then gives us a phase, and that's the, that's the quantity of interest for us. That's the Berry phase that ultimately we will integrate over the entire Brillouin zone. Okay, so you might ask, what is the, so the main point here 
is that if you think of an electron in a magnetic field, the same thing happens. Now, the, uh, the one thing to stress here is you may not be applying an external magnetic field, and this was a very important uh, insight that Haldane brought to the field, where he asked the question, can you have quantum Hall effect without a magnetic field? And I remember when I first heard that question, I was like, what does that even mean? But it was a very profound question, and that led to uh, the importance of spin-orbit coupling. So you don't break time reversal invariant. I mean, you don't break time reversal, but you can have an effective field coming from spin-orbit coupling. Just like in atomic spin-orbit coupling, you have this electron which, uh, due to relativistic effects, essentially the, uh, the orbital uh, motion acts like a magnetic field, and the Zeeman coupling of sigma to that effective field is like a coupling of sigma to the orbital motion. So that's a spin orbital coupling. And in a solid, you can replace L by the momentum uh, K, and that becomes the origin of a magnetic <coughs> field in uh, a solid. So the point is, as the system uh, evolves from one K point to another, there is, the spin is not just pointing in one direction, it could be rotating from one k point to another k point, and each, uh, e at each k point, uh, you have to do this evolution slowly so that you are allowing the spin to uh, adjust to the local direction of the magnetic field, and it also has to be slow enough that you don't cross these band gaps. And only under this adiabatic evolution then can you look at the uh, motion across the entire Brillouin zone, evaluate this integral, which gives us the total Berry phase, and that's, that's the quantity that has the information about the topology. And it's very closely related to the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, where you're essentially integrating the curvature over the entire surface area, and you get, the result is that you get integers. So you get uh, numbers like, uh, depending on the genus of the surface, either you get a zero or one and so on. And this encoding of the integral over the entire surface in an integer is at the heart of having a topological property. So you can uh, you know, basically change the curvature locally and so on, but you can't change the net integrated value. And so the point of the question I was raising is when you have a semi-metal and the bands touch, there's no way you can do this evolution slow enough to not cross the band gap because the band gap has gone to zero at these points. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, we, so this uh, very phase, essentially this overlap of the wave function at two nearby points is like a vector potential, and integrating that, and the curl of that gives you like a magnetic field, that dot ds over the surface gives you this very phase. Now this is something you all know. What is also interesting is that you can write this very fl uh, flux or the magnetic field in a different way, uh, just in terms of instead of writing it in terms of the wave function, you can also put it, uh, put the effect of this gradient or the, on the Hamiltonian, and that way what you get is this familiar form to maybe to some of you, uh, this is how you can get your quantum Hall churn numbers, but you can essentially write it in a form that manifestly shows that points that are degenerate, so they're given the denominator, where the two energies, if they are very close to each other, you can see that the Berry flux is, becomes extremely large. So this is a very general result, but it shows you that degenerate points, if they exist, will dominate the Berry curvature, okay? And this will become important when we look at the semi-metals, because that's precisely when two eigenvalues become extremely close, okay? Um, if you, the proof of that, I'm not going to go through here, that's why it's so tiny, but they will be in the notes and you can kind of work through this. It's always good to kind of 
work through these, uh, some of the algebra, and then you can uh, you know, see it play out in different situations. Okay. So um, another useful anchor point is uh, graphene, which I know many of you are familiar with. And graphene has a 2D band structure, so K is, uh, has two uh, components, Kx and Ky, dotted with sigma. In the case of graphene, sigma is uh, just the, sub, uh, it's the two atoms in the unit cell, but it could be any two-level system. But nevertheless, if you look at this and write it out with the three Pauli matrices, then uh, you get this form here um, with uh, Kx minus Iky, off diagonally and here basically rotating in two opposite directions. If you, so this is graphene with a Dirac point touching at this, uh, at this point here, at the Dirac point. If you turn on any mass by putting in a diagonal term, uh, that, uh, in, that will necessarily open up a gap, okay? So clearly the Dirac point here is not, uh, is not uh, protected. But you can ask, if you make this uh, diagonal term delta equal to kz, so you bring in uh, a third dimension, what happens then? And now you can start to see that uh, essentially what that does is all the three Pauli matrices are utilized. So the effect of putting a kz term here is to just move this Dirac point somewhere in your momentum space but it cannot gap it out anymore. So that is the simplest way to think of uh, a Dirac semi-metal as one in, in a protected Dirac semi-metal in 3D where you're utilizing all three uh, Pauli matrices. And the result of that, this is like any two-level system you can write down. Uh, this is the most general form and essentially the point of using all Dirac, all the Pauli matrices is that you can move around this Dirac point in momentum space, but you cannot remove that degeneracy, okay? So that itself tells you there is a topological reason for its protection, but there is more. Okay, so um, a Dirac semi-metal, uh, this is the Dirac equation. Um, using these gamma matrices, which you can think in terms of uh, uh, a four component spinner, uh, let's say two bands and two values of spin, uh, and two spin components. Uh, this is the general form. Now if the mass is zero, so we go to uh, a completely, uh, so we make it massless fermion. In that case, uh, this breaks up into two two by two matrices and you get the Weyl equation written down here at the bottom. And you can see that uh, essentially the Weyl equation is, um, uh, has this form. And the main point about this is that the chirality, which is uh, the gamma five, uh, the uh, gamma matrix, which is, uh, I think I had it written here. Uh, uh, the, yeah, written here in terms of the other other four gamma matrices. Basically, this is this is the uh, the chirality is the eigenvalue of gamma five. So it comes in two types. It tells you how the spin is uh, propagating uh, in relation to the momentum. It's like the it's exactly the helicity wh when you look at the massless uh, fermion. In general, chirality and helicity are different, but for massless fermions, they become identical. So chirality is basically telling you there's a term like k dot sigma and whether it is they are pointing to in the same direction or opposite directions, that defines the chirality. So you get two, wild po two Dirac points with opposite chirality and that's precisely what a wild semi-metal is. I'll come back to this in a little more detail. So here is a, a picture you might want to keep in mind. Um, this is the Weyl equation with a k dot sigma expanded around the, around the points where these nodes are. Uh, and I've dropped the, so like I've, I've set my zero to be at these nodes. And uh, the chirality defines uh, 
the chirality of the two nodes are opposite. And there's an important theorem by Nielsen and Ninomia that says that these two, uh, wa these two uh, nodal points, there must be, they must come in pairs. And the reason for that, again, goes back to this Berry curvature, that if you make some surfaces around these, around these nodal points and look at the flux, the net flux that you get from these points, which are concentrated here, must be zero. Hence, the chirality of these points must be uh, opposite to each other. OK, so that's just getting now into uh, these. Um, let me see, do you guys have questions at this point? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I have, uh, I will come to how the Dirac points separate, but what this equation, you should, I, I haven't written it out all very, uh, you know, with all my uh, k zero and so on, but let's see if the zero was here, this should be written as k minus k zero. So there, this point is not at, I've just set my zero to be at the nodal point. Similarly, I have set a zero to be at this nodal point, okay? So thanks for that question. But you can write it in general by shifting your zero. Okay, so the first thing I want to now go through are these very key properties of wild semi-metals where uh, I want to discuss how by having a degenerate set of uh, bands, uh, you will get why that necessarily dictates that there will be monopoles at the crossing. And you saw a little bit of that from that very uh, flux equation, but I want to go into, describe that in a little more detail. And then I want to look at uh, what distinguishes Dirac semi-metals and wild semi-metals and the importance of certain symmetries. And then we'll go, go further. Okay, so um, let's go back and look at this equation. Again, it's the most general equation we could write down would be uh, of the form d dot sigma or k dot sigma, however you want to think of it. This is essentially like a magnetic field in momentum space. Okay, this is like a two-level system interacting with a magnetic field. Okay, so d is, has some direction uh, and described by theta and phi. And um, as you know, for such a two-level system, you can get uh, essentially a uh, the eigenfunctions are these two spinners, plus and denoted by plus and minus. So um, the simplest thing you can do is just take these spinners and uh, evaluate uh, what, uh, what the Berry flux is uh, just using the spinner wave function. But another way, as I said, you can also use the, the formula that I wrote down earlier with the with this form, where you can look at the gradient on the Hamiltonian and then look at its matrix elements between the up and down states. That's another way to do it. And when you do that, this is what you get, okay? So here's the Hamiltonian. I'm again going to expand it near some point where uh, the, the D vector goes to zero. So uh, when I do that and take the gradient of the Hamiltonian, what you get is just the sigma term because uh, you know, the k goes away. So you get just the sigma. So the chirality is sitting here. So if you had uh, the two chiralities, this should be multiplied by the chirality, plus or minus, okay? So, um, and now you can work out these matrix elements. Again, I'm going to skip this. This is all going, it's all very straightforward. But the end result is the following. That the ups, you, know, you find that the Berry flux for both spinners has this monopole structure, okay? And uh, they come with these opposite signs. So um, that's the, uh, that's a very direct consequence of just having this, of just having this node here, which gives rise to uh, the monopole structure. Do you have questions here? Uh, 
it has this particular, uh, it has this particular, it's like a field, like if you had, so this is one of the differences between um, our regular electromagnetism where you can have magnetic fields but you don't have monopoles. The Berry flux is a very similar magnetic field in momentum space. Uh, this field does allow for monopoles with this particular uh, electro, you know, you can think of a magnetic field pattern. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I around each, so I, I will show you that. So here I've just shown you uh, w a two, so yes. So this is, I've just shown you like a two level system, right, a two level, so think of a single electron in a magnetic field, and uh, this electron will move, so you can think of one component which is always pointing along the field, another one which is always opposite to the field, so uh, this, so each component will pick up uh, a Berry flux, and the Berry flux of the two components will be equal and opposite. You know, will be a monopole of opposite sign. No, they are really each of these. They are not really uh, in the same wave function. Okay, so chi plus, chi plus is a spinner. Right, chi plus is a spinner which is say the, uh, so I think the best way to think about it is, let's say I have um, a magnetic field uh, and you know, let's say this is time. So at each time I have a magnetic field which points in some different direction. Okay, so it uh, that makes some uh, thing and then it comes back to itself. So this is some local, this is some magnetic field which is changing in time, right? And at each field, I have one solution which is chi plus where my, uh, my spin points in the direction of the magnetic field and there's a similar component pointing in the opposite direction, okay? So the, the, the uh, dip so this monopole is really coming from the, so now what, I, what you do is you take this magnetic field and let's say you put the directions on a sphere at each time and uh, when you return after some time period back to itself, that magnetic field has traced out some kind of a loop. And you're asking what is the net flux that it enclosed? So, um, what this shows is when you have the two bands, so you now you have to replace this magnetic field which was changing in time as really a magnetic field in momentum space, and you are asking when you came back to your Brillouin zone and closed it, what was the net flux that it enclosed? And what this says is essentially, you can think of it this way, that um, if you were following the upspin, upspinner, you would enclose a flux due to this monopole uh, and a down spinner would enclose a flux due to that monopole. Okay? Okay. So, um, next point is um, what are, okay, so I want to go back to, um, uh, so this, let me, let me actually first give you the result here. So, um, now think of, uh, think of a situation where you have two bands and two spins, right? So these, uh, these cones that I have drawn here uh, carry our, each of the cones are uh, four-fold degenerate. Or, or rather, I should say, each of these lines are actually two-fold degenerate, but the point is four-fold degenerate because I have two bands, up and a down band, uh, say S and P as we were talking in the morning, and uh, two spins. And so this band is twofold degenerate, and that would be called a Dirac semimetal. But under certain conditions, the chiralities will be split, and that requires understanding two symmetries that will split the Dirac point. So if you look at um, this Berry curvature, let me go back here. 
uh, this very, uh, very curvature here, uh, whose integral gives us the net berry phase, uh, as it's exactly like this magnetic field in momentum space, and it affects the equations of motion. If you think semi-classically, an electron moving in moment, uh, as a function of r and k, so in semi-classically, we can look at a point in phase space de described by r and k, and uh, momentum and position, and see how it evolves in time. Um, this is the familiar one that we know that dk dt is given by the electric field and the Lorentz force here, uh, v cross b. There's a similar e equation for dr dt. This is the band structure. This is uh, d e d k. That's uh, coming from the velocity due to the band structure. And in addition, this very flux shows up as a effective magnetic field in, mom in momentum space, which gives you an additional term here. So this is how the equations of motion are now modified by the presence of uh, omega, this very flux. And it has certain symmetries under time reversal and um, under inversion. And those symmetries can be actually deduced by using these equations. So I'm going to go through that a little slowly here because that's quite central uh, into how these wild points will develop. So under inversion, essentially uh, R, K change sign, but the spin, sigma doesn't, doesn't change sign. But under time reversal, sigma changes sign. So that's one difference. And uh, momentum changes sign, but not, uh, not the position. OK, so uh, when you put this together, now you can look at how the uh, r dot, k dot, and these velocities change. You get this, behavior, this relation here. And essentially, now you look at these equations of motion. And by making sure that, you know, that you're getting the correct signs on the left and right side, you can deduce what is the berry uh, phase, what is this berry flux going to do. So under inversion, you can see the berry flux uh, omega of k, k changes sign, but omega goes, uh, omega of k basically goes to omega of minus k. Under time reversal, omega of k goes to minus omega of minus k. So this is going to now dictate how the Dirac points are going to change uh, under these, uh, once these symmetries are broken. So this is just a summary of that again, that under time reversal, essentially k up goes to minus k down because the spin also flips. But under inversion, uh, the spin doesn't flip. So what that says is that if I have this, um, if I have this sort of uh, Dirac point, which which had this double, which had this sort of um, a degeneracy here, uh, uh, meaning each of these, I think it may be useful to make this point here. So each point here in a Dirac semi-metal. I should, this is what I meant by saying it's a four-fold degeneracy. So what I have is two bands and, and spin. So let's say this is up and down, up and down, because there's Kramer's degeneracy of each state. So this is the Dirac point. Now when you break time reversal, then uh, k up and minus k down separate. And that's how you get this separation between this four-fold degenerate point here to just a two-fold degenerate. Is that clear? And so that's, that's how you get, uh, so in the, Dirac, in the Dirac point, the chiralities were both, a Dirac point which has both time reversal and inversion has zero chirality because the two points have coincided and the net chirality is zero. By separating, now you get these points here with positive and negative chirality that have separated. 
So in a time reversal breaking while semi-metal, the minimum number of while points that you get is one pair. But in an inversion breaking while semi-metal, sorry, um, since this blue, uh, blue uh, chirality goes to the same positive, goes to positive, and you know that the net should be zero, you must have two pairs. So two blues and two reds here will then give you a net chirality of zero and be consistent with an inversion breaking uh, while semi-metal. Is that clear? OK, I'm just going to talk about the simplest case. So it doesn't matter if, but most, the reason I bring this up is most of the materials that have been found are actually the inversion breaking uh, kind. OK, let me kind of speed up a bit. Uh, do I have like 15 minutes earlier? Uh, you have 20. OK. Uh, OK, so let me speed up now a bit. Uh, so perhaps um, it's useful to now ask the next question. So you have this material. What kinds of properties does it have? And uh, can we capture some of the essence of it, like just uh, uh, some direct signature that might tell us about these monopoles? So now the problem is if you go toward transport, it's usually very messy. So you have to kind of tease out of uh, transport certain features that might capture um, these berry monopoles. So again, this is a whole big field in itself. I'll just make a few key points here. Uh, so we have charge, uh, flux, and entropy three things that are kind of playing uh, around here, and they can, be, they can be either captured on their own. So for example, in the charge sector, uh, it's essentially, you can look at this matrix here. Uh, you're applying an electric field and a thermal gradient, and you can look at this. Each of these response functions are themselves matrices. So the diagonal component here is just the conductivity. Off-diagonal is the Hall effect. Similarly here, the diagonal component is Zabeck, and the off-diagonal component is the Nernst effect. And sitting in this uh, part here in this um, LTT is the thermal conductivity in the diagonal part and thermal hall in the off-diagonal. So this, now out of this, uh, a couple of things where you can get some insight, and that it turns out if you look at something like the Nernst effect, which was, uh, which was sort of this LET sort of response where you're applying a thermal gradient but trying to un uh, read off what is the electrical response to that. So it's this uh, off-diagonal off -diagonal piece here, LET. Uh, then this Nernst effect is essentially involves uh, an integral of the Berry curvature and the entropy. The Hall effect, which you are more familiar with, is essentially the integral of the Berry curvature over the entire filled states. So this is uh, much less sensitive than the uh, Nernst effect, which is the Berry curvature weighted by the entropy, which really peaks at the Fermi energy. So these are the ways you can go after certain uh, response functions which may be more sensitive to the topological defects or the topological features. So one of the things we found is that in general, when you have this while point, the chemical potential is not necessarily at the while point, right? We, we, we saw that the um, while point had the strongest berry curvature because that's where the monopole was sitting. Everywhere else also it picks up some phase, but it's much less. So most materials will turn out to have a chemical potential somewhere up in the band. But as you raise the temperature, in most metals, we don't worry much about what the chemical potential is doing because Fermi energies are huge on the order of EF and temperatures are much, much lower than that. Here, uh, in these semi-metals, the chemical potential can be very close to, to the while, while point, but still away from that but there can be substantial movement of the chemical potential on the scale of the temperature. So
So you can utilize that feature to raise the temperature, drive the chemical potential to the wild point, and that way experience a very strong berry curvature coming from the monopole. And what that does is in the Nernst effect, as a function of temperature, it starts out being zero because uh, this system is not breaking, this if the system doesn't break time reversal, uh, say it's an inversion breaking wild semi-metal, the Nernst effect is zero at zero temperature, but it gives this big peak at a finite temperature. Because at that point, the, wild, uh, the chemical potential has moved to the wild point and it's able to pick up this large effect. So there are a host of materials, and uh, you know, we don't need to go into them in detail, but you can get type one wild semi-metals, which are um, either time reversal breaking, there's this candidate here, and inversion breaking different combinations of tantalum, arsenide, tantalum phosphide, and so on. And you can also get type two wild semi-metals where you, these can uh, need not, these can be more like, um, uh, you know, you can have a whole pocket and an electron pocket touching, and that can give what is called a type two. But again, these are details. But this was.
there any very quick questions uh, for Nandini?